The Little Mermaid, the first film of the Disney Renaissance, has long been the subject of both incredible praise and scathing social critique. Said critique generally goes thusly. In the film, Ariel's enchanted life under the sea is interrupted when she sets eyes upon a human. She gives up her entire life to be with him, quite literally erasing her identity and somehow lives happily ever after with a man she just met. The concern with this is that young girls who watch The Little Mermaid will internalize this and that the film reinforces negative pre-existing values in society as they relate to gender roles and women's aspirations. This take is similar to those of other Disney Renaissance movies. Beauty and the Beast is derided for somehow normalizing Stockholm Syndrome or that the Lion King is secretly racist because the hyenas, the antagonists, are played by minority actors Whoopi Goldberg and Cheech Marin. In the case of Beauty and the Beast, what happens between Belle and Beast is not technically Stockholm Syndrome, and I would not even call Beauty and the Beast representative of abusive relationships considering the relationship only occurs after Beast corrects his behavior. The narrative of the film does not back up this erroneous claim. The Lion King has some unfortunate framing of the poor and the well-to-do, which is a topic for another video, but the racism claim falls apart when you consider that the other hyena is played by Jim Cummings, and other minority actors like James Earl Jones and the late Robert Guillaume perform some of the good guy characters. So it is with The Little Mermaid, a film sometimes lambasted for telling young girls to give up your lives for a husband. But that's not actually what happens in the movie. First of all, Ariel is not giving up a rich and fulfilling life under the sea because she does not find her life under the sea rich and fulfilling. We are introduced to Ariel by her absence. She neglects attending a concert for her father in order to search for surface world objects in a ship. She has a whole collection of surface world knickknacks and baubles. In fact, by the time we meet Ariel, she has collected a grand total of 20 thingamabobs, far more thingamabobs than one ever practically requires. Ariel is profoundly unsatisfied with her life in the undersea kingdom of Atlantica, as evidenced by her song in which she explicitly states just that. She wants to be where the people are. Wants to see, wants to see them dancing. <clears throat> the idea that Ariel is giving up an otherwise satisfying life for a man is invalidated by the very fact that she does not have a satisfying life to begin with. But, that could still send the message that life itself, for women, is unsatisfying without a man. This complicates matters, right? Except, that's also not actually what happens in the narrative. Meeting Prince Eric is not the catalyst for Ariel seeking out Ursula, the sea witch. For one thing, she already wanted to live on land, and for another, that's not what happens in the scenes immediately prior to Ariel searching for Ursula. The catalyst to Ariel finally summoning up the courage to leave her home and join the surface world is her father destroying her collection. King Triton rejects Ariel's obsession with the surface world, and this upsets her so much that she decides to take matters into her own hands. Obviously Prince Eric is part of why she wants to live on the surface world, but her desire to live there predates her meeting Eric. Meeting Eric and her father being extremely hard on her were simply the last straws. Furthermore, Ariel does not go to see Ursula with the intention of becoming human. That was an idea put into her head by Ursula. When Ursula suggests it, Ariel is surprised and initially hesitant. The film does not characterize Ursula as having a good idea. Her deal is Faustian. She's a stand-in for the devil himself. The events of the film itself contradict the claim that the film endorses marriage to a man over a woman's independence. However, this is a film for children, and children don't always have an eye for details. It's completely reasonable to think that children might watch this movie and internalize a message that, while not actually there, is pretty close to being there. The fact that the movie does not explicitly endorse marriage over independence is not the strongest argument. Movies contain unintentional messaging, usually born of prevailing, unquestionable societal standards. The Little Mermaid definitely traffics in love conquers all, which is not exactly accurate at best, and maybe even dangerous at worst. Some beliefs in society are so commonplace that they become background radiation. In recent years, Disney has clumsily tried to course-correct as it relates to this particular theme. 
Frozen has a lot to say about love and when it's real and when it's not and the importance of not rushing into things. So much, in fact, that the film explicitly states this multiple times, practically right to the audience, in hopes of both sending the right message and also playing off its own history. Disney's attempt to recontextualize itself is the stuff of marketing and defensiveness more than genuine introspection. However, again, The Little Mermaid tried to give young girls a more positive and active role model than, say, Snow White and Sleeping Beauty, who are more passive characters in their own stories. Ariel sings that she is a bright young woman, and she takes matters into her own hands to get what she wants, and forces her father to realize she is capable of making decisions and running her own life. Sebastian and King Triton speak of this toward the end of the film, solidifying this as a deliberate message of the story. Ariel will not be fooled into living a life she does not want, even if sung in a rousing number featuring the Duke of Soul. Ariel consistently stands up to her father and does not deter from chasing her dreams. The Little Mermaid is also the first Disney film in which the princess does the rescuing. Ursula tells Ariel that she must choose between Prince Eric and having a relationship with King Triton. But Ariel defies these expectations, marries Eric, and wins over her father. Prince Eric is brought up as evidence against the Little Mermaid as a pretty but empty man who Ariel loves inexplicably. While Eric does not get a lot of screen time or character development, everything we learn about Eric shows that he's a good choice for Ariel and that he respects her. The film does not pin down exactly when the events take place, but the narrative is clearly from at least a century ago, and Eric is a relatively modern and sensitive man. He finds displays of himself as a warrior to be distasteful. He's a flautist, he's good with animals, he has a good sense of humor, and he never tries to pressure Ariel into the relationship or into anything physical. And when he discovers she has a disability, he treats her with sympathy but never patronizes her. Eric never refers to her disability as a negative while he courts Ariel. Declaring The Little Mermaid a feminist movie or an anti-feminist movie is reductive. A movie is not feminist or anti-feminist as if a scorecard can neatly declare either of those things. Rather, The Little Mermaid can be viewed quite well under a feminist reading. There is some good stuff in The Little Mermaid. It's not hard to find. And now there's elegant Holiday Ariel in her sparkling gown and fancy fur hat. You're so beautiful. Holiday Ariel even has a fur-trimmed fin. And Flounder's there to celebrate, too. And here comes soft, cuddly Sebastian, an adorable Flounder. I love you both. The Little Mermaid Holiday Ariel doll and Sebastian and Flounder set each sold separately from Tycho.